once again, quickly to recapture, this is what I have taken from my introduction. This is the input to the lexical analyzer, which is a sequence of characters. And what it generates is a sequence of tokens. And in the process, it does error reporting whenever it finds that some token is not properly formed. And the whole thing is modeled using regular expressions. And we then use finite state machine or finite state automata to implement lexical analyzer. Right? Now, before we get into really the implementation, we need to understand a few terms. Okay? So one common term or I will actually introduce three terms to you. So one is what we know as the token. Another is the lexeme. And the third term is going to be rules for construction of tokens. So we need to understand clearly what are these terms and what does it mean, uh, what do these terms mean. Okay? So once again let me go back and start taking an example and introduce these terms by an example. So suppose I write an expression like this and I am trying to tokenize this, I am trying to compile this particular expression and obviously remember that this is in certain contexts, so I am not looking at the whole program, I am just focusing on this one. And typically what I will be doing is, I will be passing on information by like saying that here is an identifier, here is another identifier, here is another identifier, this is an assignment operator and this is an addition operator. So my stream of tokens is going to be id is assigned id Okay. So this is what my input to the syntax analyzer will be. Okay. So what we have are, if I look at this, this and this, these are really nothing but the tokens. Okay. But if I look at this string, if I look at this string and if I look at this string, these are really the lexemes which are associated with these tokens. Okay. So tokens are this class of this class which we are going to pass on to the syntax analyzer associated with each of these entities is going to be a string which we call lexeme and then we will have rules which will say that how these tokens are going to get constructed. Okay? So this is the overall three terms we are going to use very commonly. Okay? So sentence consists of a string of tokens which is really a syntactic category. So if I look at identifier here this is nothing but syntactic category. Okay, so this is one thing we will use. Second will be, so here is an example where we have numbers, identifiers, <coughs> keywords, strings and so on. Okay? And when I look at sequence of characters in a token, which is really this sequence which is a lexeme. So for example, if I say 100.01, that's a number. Okay? Or if I say counter, which is an identifier, or I may say a keyword which is a constant, or there may be a string. So a string always comes within quotes and here we may say that this is really the lexeme which is associated with this particular lexeme, uh, with this particular token. Okay? And what are the rules of description? So I may have a rule like this which says that how an identifier is going to get constructed. So each identifier must start with a letter and must be followed by zero or more occurrences of letter or number. Okay? And in the process what we are going to do is when I tokenize my input, I also want to discard all the useless information. So what is useless information here? So all the spacers here may be useless. So I may put one blank, I may put two blanks, I may put a tag, but that doesn't add anything to the meaning of the program. So I may just discard that. So all these white spaces which are blanks, tabs, new line characters, all these are going to be just discarded. <coughs> Unless they occur as part of a string. Like if they are part of a string, then that is really the lexeme and I cannot discard that. And also what we want to do is, Whenever we deal with numbers, I don't want to pass this as a character sequence, but I want to convert this into a number. So for example, when I'm reading this, I'm going to read six characters, which will be 100.01. One, zero, 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 one. But when I pass on this information to the syntax analyzer, I'll say I have read a number whose value is 100.01. So I should be able to convert this character sequence into a number. So for all numbers, 
I will do this conversion. So when I pass on this information, I'll say here is a token which is number, and the value of the number is 31. I'll not say value of this number is as a character sequence p followed by one. <coughs> and we also need to recognize whether I have certain keywords. Now, the rules of construction of keywords are similar to rules of construction of identifiers. Okay? But certain keywords in some languages, or in most languages, if not some, they are going to be reserved. So we'll have to then take an input like this. So if I say that my input is counter being assigned counter plus increment, this is a common thing you will see x is signed x plus 1. Right? So what will I pass? to the syntax analyzer. This is what I'm going to pass to the syntax analyzer. And every time I do that, I'll have to check whether I'm dealing with one of the identifiers, uh, one of the keywords. Okay, so if I say if is a keyword in my language, then I don't want to perhaps deal with these kind of situations. Okay? Some languages will permit that, but most languages will not. Okay, so I need to figure out that whether I'm dealing with an identifier or I'm dealing with a keyword. And keyword is a list of words which are reserved in a language. Right? So are functional specifications clear to everyone? What we are trying to do here? Okay. So let's move on and let's see how does it interface with other phases of the compiler. Okay? So if you go back and recall the compiler structure we had, we had somewhere in the first phase in this compiler, which was the lexical analyzer, and then we had syntax analyzer. So really, if I'm looking at lexical analyzer, it is dealing with two entities. One, which is input, and another is syntax analyzer. Okay? It does not have to deal with any other phase other than the symbol table, where it will have to put all the information. Okay? So this is how the lexical analyzer looks. It is feeding information to syntax analyzer, and is taking input from the sequence of characters. Now, assume that the syntax analyzer is the one which is driving the whole process. Okay? So look at it this way that when I'm starting my process of compilation, syntax analyzer says, I want to pass something, give me a token. And syntax analyzer is asking for a sequence of tokens. And who will it pass? Obviously, the lexical analyzer. So what it says is, it just asks for a token. And now to generate a token, what lexical analyzer has to do? It has to start reading characters from input. Okay? So it starts reading characters from input. Okay. And it starts forming now a token. Okay. So for example, if I say I want to compile this, syntax analyzer says, give me a token, and lexical analyzer then reads A. But by reading A, will it know that it is a token or not? It doesn't know. It has to read more. Okay. So it has to continue to read. So it will read then the next character. And then it suddenly realizes that I have reached a word boundary. And A was really between, the word boundary was between A and assignment symbol. Okay. So in the process, what it has done is it has read an extra character, logically. Okay. So what happens here is that it has formed a token, which is A. And in the process, it also has to say that whatever extra I have read, push that back to the input stream, because this is going to be the beginning of a new token. Is this point clear to everyone? So what we are trying to do here is that when lexical analyzer is trying to read characters and forming a token, it identifies a token. And in some cases, not always, in some cases, it will also have to push back all these extra characters into the input sequence. Okay? Logically, that is what is happening. We will see how the implementation happens. So pushback is required you to look ahead, because here I am saying that I will have to do a look ahead to find out the word bound. And here is an example. So if I say I'm trying to read greater than, equal to, or greater than, I will not know unless I have read the next character whether it is part of the same token or not. Okay. So this is implemented. This pushback, etc., can be just implemented through a buffer. And all that means is when I'm reading a character or pushing back a character, what it means is that I have an input pointer which is moved left or right. Okay. So pushing back is not unget cat like you do in C. Okay. You can just use a buffer to implement it, and that will take care of this <coughs> input pointer. Okay? So keep input in a buffer, and keep moving this pointer over the buffer, left or right. right? Okay? So how do I implement lexical analyzer? So we understand what lexical analyzer does. Let's start looking at 
or I'm going to implement, and I'll talk about three approaches to implementation. One is that since I'm doing low-level I.O., and I want this process to be very efficient, I can always program this in assembly language. Okay? That is one option that is available to me. Another option is, obviously, I can use a high-level language, like a programming language C, or I can use tools like Lex or Flex, which are where I just write specifications in, and we do then implement my lexical Okay. So remember that not only I'm worried about functional correctness of a phase, I'm also worried about the <coughs> speed of a phase, how fast it can read my tokens, because you don't want a situation where you have a program which is very slowly reading your characters and that becomes the bottleneck. Because remember, this phase involves a lot of disk I.O. Right? Your program is going to be on the disk, and there's a lot of I.O. which will take this. So which effort should I take? The three. Any ideas? <coughs> First one? Yeah. Third? Okay. But what about efficiency? Development time will be very less, true, but run time? Run time will be slower than other things. So do I want that? So, oh, can be very difficult. <coughs> Try writing an assembly program for this I.O. versus a character read in a high-level language. There will be noticeable difference in major the time. So normally, if I look at pros and cons, okay, this one is obviously the most efficient because you can do low-level I.O., but also it's going to be most difficult to implement. Okay. This is definitely efficient, not as efficient as this, and is difficult to implement, not as difficult as this, once again. Okay. But if I go to the third approach, okay, it's easy to implement, but is not going to be as efficient as the first two cases okay, because I have no control over I.O. I'm only hoping that my tool will be doing good I.O., tool will be doing good function management, and that is why you see we had tools like Flex which said fast Lex, okay? because Lex did not implement I.O. very efficiently in this. Okay? So this also goes back to the first point that if you find that your tool is not efficient and you get a better tool, then you can actually have a faster compiler. Okay? So normally what happens is in practice, okay, when we start implementing, we'll start with the third approach. Okay, because we don't want to become a bottleneck for the subsequent phases. Okay? But as the rest of the compiler is getting developed, okay, you keep moving to a high-level language and keep implementing at least I.O. processes in assembly language. Okay? So to make sure that not only you are functionally correct, but you are also very efficient. Okay? So always start from this, but slowly migrate at least to this level and then put all your I.O. at low level. Make sure that I.O. does not become a bottleneck in whatever language you are using. Okay? So we need to therefore understand how to implement a lexical analyzer using this approach and how to implement a lexical analyzer using this approach in a systematic manner. So even when I want to write programs, I want to write C programs to implement a lexical analyzer. I just don't want to be writing arbitrary C program, but I want to have certain structures over it. Okay? And we talk about both these approaches of implementation. Okay. Is point clear to everyone? Any comments, questions here? Okay. So let's move on and let's actually take a small language and try to construct a lexical analyzer process. Okay. And let's see what goes on in lexical analyzer. Okay. So this language is going to allow white spaces, it is going to have numbers, and it will have arithmetic operators in an expression. Okay. And what it is going to do is it is going to return tokens and is going to return an attribute to syntax analyzer. So token will be something of this class, okay? So it will say it's an identifier, and my attribute may be saying either it's a lexeme, or it may be an entry to the symbol table, okay? Or attribute may be saying that, so if I write something like this, A is assigned, say, B plus 46, it may say that here token is number, and attribute is number 46, okay? So there's the information it is going to return. Okay, and what we'll do is, we will assume that I have a global variable just, just for the sake of implementation of this program. Instead of returning a value, I'll say there's a global variable where I'm going to copy this value 
and then the subsequent phases are just going to read this global variable and we pick up this value. So token value is my global value which is going to set to the value of the number and what it requires is that we have a set of tokens which are defined and then we describe strings belonging to each of the tokens. Okay? So let's just look at the structure of such a C program. Okay? So I'm just writing a standard C program without worrying too much about the structure and really the point of showing you this program is that how horrendous it can be to write the lexical analyzer which just involves so few tokens. Okay? And then motivate you to use high level specifications and some tools which can then make sure that this job is done correctly and efficiently. Okay? So you'll have all these hash include statements and I have initialized this token well to none. Okay? None is some hash defined character which is an integer now. Okay? And here is a function lex. Okay? where I have t as an integer defined and this is where the function closes. Okay? Now what are the things I need to do? Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, this, this is not visible maybe because of brightness but what this says is while one. That means go in an infinite loop and keep reading a character from input. Okay? So this is reading a character and first thing I do is I do a get cat. Right? I read the first character and then I find out whether this is a blank or a tab character, if this is a blank or tab, I just ignore it. Okay? I don't want any white spaces in my input, I'm just discarding it. Otherwise, if this is a digit, okay, then what do I have to do? If my input is a digit, then what do I do? Make a decision. Make a decision like? Whether I have to wait or to do something else. I cannot wait. There's nothing like waiting here. The next so I have to read the next character and find out whether that is a digit or that is forming a number. Okay? So I will keep reading as long as I get digits and as I am reading I will also keep converting these digits to a number. Right? And whenever I get something which is a non-digit then I will say I have reached a word boundary and I must start beginning of a new token. Okay? So this is what we do here. We say token value is t minus whatever is ASCII value of 0 and t is then get cat and then I say while I keep on getting digits, keep on constructing token well and how do I construct token well? I, it's a simple arithmetic expression, I take the previous value, whatever I have read, previous value is multiplied by 10, whatever I have read that is added and I go in this loop okay? and I keep on doing it so long as I keep on getting digits. Okay? Now you can see that when I come out of this loop, I will have the number as token well. But I'll also, I would have read at least one extra character to find out whether it was digit or not. Okay. Then only I'll come out of the loop. So that's an extra character I have read. Okay. So that is the first thing I'll have to do, that I'll have to put it back into the input. So I unget that character. Right? Okay. Now once I do that, then what happens? So what other situations could have been there in my input? Okay. I request everyone to please switch off their mobile phones and remember it from the next class onwards. When you enter the room, just switch it off. <coughs> so, what other characters I could have got? I have a blank, I have a tab which are white spaces, I have a digit, and what else I could have in my specification? I have arithmetic symbols. Right? So, here I know that I have recognized a number which I am returning. Okay? Otherwise, what I do is, I say that token well is none, token well is not a number, and whatever is the t, I just return that. So if I read a plus, for example, I just say return plus. Okay, if I read a minus, I return minus. Otherwise, I return a number. Okay? So this is the only specification I had. I had expressions which consisted of just the numbers and arithmetic operators. And I'm just starting by cases. Now you can see that just to do this, I had to write a program, C program, which is like 10 to 15 lines of code. Okay? But more interesting part, okay? I had to write, I had to use all these data structures. Okay? I had to use this iteration here. I had to do an IO here. Okay? So this is what really makes a lexical analyzer complicated. Okay? Now imagine you have full specifications of a programming language like C or Pascal okay? or Ada or anything. Okay? And if you start writing a C program like this, the chances that you will make an error, okay, somewhere in your declaration, somewhere not using a loop properly, 
not returning, returning a character properly to the input buffer and so on okay, are very nice. Okay. So this approach is not clearly something we want. Right? Okay. So what do we do now? Okay. So one extra thing okay, which uh, I am bringing at the end. Now read this. Okay. What it is saying is that if my input character is a new line character, then I am saying increment some line number by 1 and I have initialized my line number to 1. Right? Now what, why do I need line numbers here? In lexical analyzer, I am just returning this token, right? And I am passing this structure. So for example, if I had something like this, suppose my input was something like this. Okay. I would have returned the same set of tokens. So why I am capturing this information like line number? How does it help me in doing parsing and rest of the compilation? So when I have to do debugging, at that point of time, I must remember that for which line number, what was the code which was generated, because my view as a user is going to be that I want to take breaks at certain. Have you used GDB? How many of you are familiar with GDB? Almost everyone, right? So when you set a break point, you say, break at certain line number. Okay. So how do I map that line number and code? Somewhere I start generating this information. Okay. So this information will also be communicated subsequently. It will remain some as some tag within my code so that I can then start breaking at certain line number. And this is if you now go back and start reading what I showed you in one of the files that compiler is part of overall program development environment and it has to feed information to all other phases. Okay, so debugging was one of the phases there. Make sense? Okay. So, so far, okay, we have seen some aspects of what lexical analyzer is doing. But let's also see what are the kind of pitfalls we have to be aware of. What are the problems we may face in writing lexical analyzer. So when I start looking at specifications of a language, I must raise certain flags if certain situations are there. Okay. So what are the kind of problems I may face here? One is obviously that I am reading my input character by character. So your I.O. has to be very efficient. Okay. Also, look ahead character is going to determine what kind of token to read and when the current token ends. So for example, if this is, if I am reading this and then I read this, this is going to determine what kind of token I had. Okay. And this also is saying what is beginning of the new token. So when I start, for example, something like, X, Y, Z is a sign something. By reading this character, I have some idea of what kind of token or what kind of character I am expecting. Okay. That will also give me a hint of what is the finite state machine I am going to use to identify this particular token. Okay. And first character alone cannot determine what kind of token we are going to get. Okay. So if I read, for example, first character of this, so the example I already gave you, if I have this and this, it's not clear just by reading either this or this, what is it that I am going to get, unless I read at least few extra characters. Okay? In this case, I am assuming to begin with that look ahead of one will be sufficient to find out, okay? but we will see situations where look ahead of one character is not going to be sufficient. Okay? So next issue that comes is that how do I interface with the symbol table? Okay? So what was my interface in the sim with the symbol table? So if you recall very quickly, what I had was a symbol table here and symbol table lexical analyzer is to put information in the symbol table okay. and what kind of information it can put in the symbol table what information lexical analyzer has at any point of time it only knows the lexeme and the token it has no other information okay. so what will it put in the symbol table so when i say that i encounter a is a sign b plus c and it says a is a token what in more information I have is the lexeme, right? So I should be able to then, in my symbol table, say that I have a token which is of type identifier and it has lexeme A, right? But now imagine this situation that I have this A is assigned A plus C and this is what I'm tokenizing, okay? Now again, you will say I have an identifier where lexeme is A. But that must have already been entered in the symbol table when I process this part. 
So do I make a duplicate entry in the symbol table? No. So how do I know that this already exists in the symbol table? See that information is there, pointers are there, but this is a table, right, which has multiple records. So I must be able to look up this table and say whether such a token or such a lexeme already exists. Right? Because if a token with this lexeme already exists, then I don't want to make an entry. But when I come to this, I'll say, again, insert this identifier with the lexeme C. Right? So these are the two functions I need. I should be able to look up in my symbol table, and I should be able to insert something in my symbol table. What do I insert? The only thing I can say is, insert this token and this lexeme, and look up will say, look up this particular string. Okay. And these two functions should be sufficient interface as far as lexical analyzer is concerned to the symbol table. I don't have to worry about the rest of the structure of the symbol table. I don't have to worry about the rest of the fields in my symbol table. Right? These are the only two fields I am going to deal with as far as lexical analyzer is concerned. So this is what we do, that I am going to store information for subsequent phases because I need to know what my lexemes are okay? and I need two functions which will say that save this particular lexeme and this token and just return a pointer, okay? and before I insert, I also want to look up and say that if this already exists, then just give me an entry to the symbol table, if it does not exist, okay, then give me another pointer, then you say that it does not exist. Okay? And these two functions are sufficient interface, okay? and how do I implement symbol table? Okay? Now if I look at symbol table, one very preliminary implementation I gave you was that I want to have some kind of structure of uh, array of structures. So what I want to do here is, I want to have, let's say, one row corresponding to each of the variables I have in my program. And this will consist of information like saying, what is the token? What is the lexeme? And then I'll have more information. So I'll have, for example, type, I'll have address, and some other information which is part of the symbol table. But right now, let's focus on this part. Okay? Now, if this is the kind of space I'm using. Okay? We'll not worry about how efficient this is at this point of time. That we issue we'll address later. So assume that I have now an array. Okay? And you can see that one thing when I do a lookup here okay, is going to be a linear lookup. Right? <coughs> Unless I continuously sort the symbol table and do some binary research. Okay. So assuming that I have linear lookup because that's really not the issue at this point of time. Okay. When I'm implementing this, okay, look at how much space I'm consuming. Okay. And look at, because at this point of time, I'm concerned only with these two fields. Okay. Let's look up how much space I'm consuming here. Okay. Now if I look at token, okay, how much space do I need for tokens to store a token? So let's talk in terms of bytes. Bits and bytes. Let's go to low level implementation. Right? How much space do I need to store a token? Depends on the number of tokens. Depends on the number of tokens in I have in my language. Okay? So suppose I have 24 different kinds of tokens in my language. Okay? Then how many bits I need? 32 is the maximum. 32 is something which is close to this. So just 2 to the power 5, I can do everything in 5 bits. Okay? So if I have 24 kinds of tokens, then 5 bits are sufficient. So that is very efficient, right? I can always, and for each language I know, predetermined, I can predetermine how, what are the kind of tokens I'll encounter. I can encode it in terms of bits, and I can have this compact information. So there is really no space overhead here, okay? Now what about the lexeme part? How much space do I reserve for lexeme? How much space do I need for lexeme? Depends on the? Depends on, so if I'm storing my identifiers here, it depends upon how many bytes I can have in each identifier. And most programming languages today will permit up to 32 bytes. So you can have a variable which is 32 character long. So that means I need to store, I need to reserve space of 32 bytes. Okay? But if I look at average size of variable, when you have written programs, right? So what is the average size of variable do you use? 
variable length? Five six. Five six. Rarely more than that. Okay. So average will be five six. Some variables may be most variables will be like i j k and some variables may be like seven eight. Okay. And if you take average, it will come to five six. Now thirty two bytes. Reserving thirty two bytes when I know for sure that on the average I will not be using five to six bytes is highly inefficient space wise. Okay. So I need to come up with some better data structure than this. So what will give me some ideas? Okay. So this clearly, I mean, you yourself are saying there is lot of space which is being wasted here. I want to recover this space. So what do I do? Make it dynamic. Make it dynamic. So so what do I do to make it dynamic? Yeah, you were saying something. Okay. So very good. So what we can do is that I can have some separate memory. Which I can keep allocating for my identifiers, and all I need to do is have a pointer here, which will point to this. So this is what my lexeme is going to be. So let me say this is identifier one, so identifier two, and so on. Okay, and each one will have a pointer here, right? Okay. Now you can see that what is my overhead? Pointer typically is going to be four bytes. Okay. So if your pointer is only four bytes long, then you know that. What we are using is very compact, and overhead on the average for each lexeme is going to be just four bytes. Okay, and this is what is implemented almost in all symbol tables. That fixed amount of space to store lexeme is not something which is advisable, as it is going to waste a lot of space, and therefore stay, store all these lexemes in separate space. And each lexeme is separated by some character because I don't want to store information like what is the length of the lexeme. Okay. And symbol table has just pointer to lexemes. Okay, so one implementation could have been like I have this fixed space for lexeme and all other attributes versus, okay, which is usually going to be 32 bytes, versus I have all these separate spaces for lexemes, which is stored separately, and I have just the pointers to all these symbol tables, now all these lexemes. Okay, so that makes my implementation space-wise more efficient. Okay. Now, next issue that comes is how do I handle keywords? Okay. So, how do I handle keywords? Okay. So, if I say, so when I wrote something like a is assigned b plus c, suppose I write a is assigned if plus five. Okay. And as I start scanning my input from left to right, I say that I encounter if, and suppose in my language, if is a reserved keyword. Cannot be used as an identifier. Now, how do I know that if is and as far as rules are con concerned, rule of construction of this is same as rule of construction of this. Okay, so this will say it's an identifier. How do I know that this is not an identifier? How do I handle this situation? With well, whatever we have seen so far. There's a priority of something. So if the keyword is conflicting with identifier, then keyword will have more. Yes. So I need to maintain a list of keywords. Okay. If I maintain just a list of keywords, okay, then I know that first, before saying that this is an identifier, check it against the list. Okay. And how do I maintain this list? Okay. I can always initialize my symbol table by inserting all the keywords initially in it. And whenever I do a lookup, what will happen? Lookup will just say that this already exists in my symbol table and it is a keyword. I don't have to worry anything about. Okay. So this is really what we do. That when I am saying that insert these as lexemes, okay, I just initialize my symbol table with all the keywords, okay. And since I have this lookup function, lookup function is going to ensure that I will never conflict between a keyword and an identifier. Lookup function will always make sure because before I insert, I always have to do a lookup. So if I just do a sequence of inserts in the symbol table before the process of compilation starts, okay, then I have taken care of this, and any subsequent lookup is going to Return a non-zero value, and therefore I'll say that this cannot be used as a token, or this cannot be used as an identifier. Okay. Now, as far as lexical analyzer is concerned, is this an error? No, this is not an error, right? Who will catch that this is an error? Which phase? Parser will say that you cannot use a keyword in an expression, right? As far as lexical analyzer is concerned. This is going to just return a sequence of tokens, which will say identifier, assign, keyword, add, number, and that's it. Okay. 
So you must also remember that what are the kind of errors which lexical analyzer can catch and what are the kind of errors which subsequent phases are going to handle. Okay. So using a keyword inside an expression is as far as lex is concerned or lexical analyzer is concerned is not an error, but some subsequent phases are going to capture this information provided lexical analyzer has supplied information that this is a keyword and not an identity. Yes, okay. So, what are the kind of difficulties I may face? What are the kind of flags I need to raise before I start designing a lexical analyzer? Okay. So, so far everything sounds reasonable, if not very simple. So, let's start now raising red flags. Okay. So, one, the first red flag that comes is can I use a format which is this? versus a format which is this. These are two formats which express the same language. Okay. Could I have written this also in a form which will say so this, this and this, do they mean the same thing? Depends on the implementation of what? No. There is nothing to do with implementation. The reason is this is part of the specification of the language. This language tells me that whether I can write an expression in this form or this form or this form. Okay? If all the three forms are valid, then I should be able to write design lexical analyzers, which will say it doesn't matter what is the input you give me, even if you give me one character per input or one word per input or per line of input, I'm okay with that. Okay? Versus there are languages which will say no. You cannot use this format, you cannot use this format, you must use only this format. Okay. So there are issues like whether I am dealing with free format languages versus fixed format languages. Now this is not a part of implementation issue, this is a part of language specification. And lexical analyzer must implement whatever is specified by the language. Lexical analyzer is not supposed to deviate from whatever is the language specification. So this is part of language specification which says that whether lexemes are in fixed positions versus it's a free format language, right? Okay. Now, do we know any fixed format language? Okay. Python and okay. the first language was the fixed format language. Portrait was the fixed format. Okay. So, whenever you deal with these formats, okay, you need to worry about whether you are in fixed format versus free format. Okay. So typically, if I'll, I'll show you more examples of fixed format language and what kind of difficulties they can introduce. Next issue we have to deal with is, I said right in the beginning my input is going to be a sequence of characters and I need to tokenize it. And then we said that I'm going to define certain word boundaries and how do I determine word boundaries? I'll say either I encounter a blank or some blank space. That means either a sequence of blanks or tab or new line, that will be a word boundary. <coughs> or some kind of punctuation, which is like comma, full stop, semicolon, and so on, or I encounter a character from a different class of characters. Okay? So if I say I have A here and I come to a sign, then I know it's a different class of characters. This is the word boundary, although there is no blank thing. Okay? But blanks typically in most languages are used as word separators. Okay? Now let's look at a slightly different situation. So here is one expression. Let me write one more expression. Are the two same? Okay. So answer is, I don't know whether they are the same or not, depends on the language specification. Now the languages which say that blank even when it comes in an identifier, let me just ignore. Makes life more complicated. Okay? Blank can be put anywhere, and as designer of the lexical analyzer, I have to figure out what it means. Okay? So blank here means saying that this is count. Ignore these blanks, but don't ignore it. Okay? 
this is to be treated like a blank. Similarly, this blank and this blank can be ignored to say this is count, but this blank cannot be ignored and this says this is end of count. So even blank now becomes contextual. Okay. Where it occurs, that makes a lot of difference. So things like in Fortran, blanks are just important in literal strings. At rest of the places, I just ignore blanks, okay. as if they don't exist. Okay. So when I write counter versus count blank er, they are actually the same identifier. Okay. And any idea, I mean, why, why such kind of format was prevalent? Is it by design, by accident? What was the reason? I mean, see, as computer scientists and as student of this any subject, I mean, we must also know a bit of history. Okay? So I gave you one part of history, like how compilers were designed initially. Right? So is it by accident or by design? By design. Do they like to make spaces? Do they? Do the programmers like to give spaces? No, actually it makes your program highly unreadable. Okay? So programmers don't want spaces. The earlier programs were maybe not typed. Earlier programs were not typed. Then? So they were written by hand. Maybe. They were written by hand. And then how do I pass it on to the computer? See, whatever program you write, okay? earlier programs and today programs are all written by hand. Even today, we expect that before you go to the lab, at least you will have some structure of the code in mind. Okay? You will have some structure before you go and sit on terminal and start just banging on the keyboard. Okay? But what happened was earlier, okay, so okay, here is another, another example, and this is really <coughs> much more complex. Okay? So take this, okay? and I will come back to this point of blanks once again. Okay. So take this, when I say do 10 i, and there is a blank between do 10 and i is equal to 1.25, and this says do 10 i is equal to 1, 1.25. Okay. Now, what in the first case is this is really an identifier which is do 10 i, which is being assigned a value 1.25, the okay. real identifier. Okay. And the second one says this is actually a for loop which says that. I want to iterate from this statement up to the statement whose label is 10 and the iteration space is given by lower bound as 1 and upper bound is 25 in steps of 1. So this says do everything from this statement up to statement 10 for values of i varying from 1 to 25. So that is like a form. Okay. But interesting part is that I can also write do 10i in this form. I do not have to put blanks here. Okay. So this now, when I see this comma, I have to figure out oh, what I am dealing with is not an assignment, but I am dealing with a for loop. Okay. So I have to go back and tokenize this. I must say that oh, do is a keyword and 10 is a label and i is an identifier. Okay. So not only blanks are not important, but in certain situation, even if I do not put blanks, okay, that does not mean that I have the same token. I need to take do 10i and break that into three tokens. Okay. And when will I know this? when I encounter either dot here or a comma here. Right? Interesting situation. Right? That means saying it does not matter how you write, compiler is smart enough to figure out what you meant. Right? That I could have written in any of these formats and compiler was able to figure out what was the language or what is it, what was the intent of the program. Okay? And it really happened the reason when we say it happened by design, what it meant was, I mean that was designed because we wanted to prevent certain accidents. Okay? So the first line is a variable assignment, second line is beginning of a do loop and reading from left to right, one really cannot distinguish between these two till I encounter either this comma or a dot. Okay? And why I mean we used these fixed formats and we used these ignoring the blanks and not ignoring the blanks in some way because <coughs> at that point of time we did not have these terminals where today I mean you have this keyboard and terminal and you have an editor and you just go and type your program and visually you can see whether your program is at least space wise correct or not and then you can do various kind of formatting you can do editing before you pass it on to the compiler. Okay. Earlier we did not have that luxury and really the way programs were typed was that we had these 
punch cards. Okay? So you go and type your program on the punch card, and it is almost impossible to correct a punch card. You cannot correct a punch card, you have to retype the punch card, and people did not have that kind of time. Okay? So a situation was something like this, that I typed my program on punch card. Each card will have one statement, and having a thousand line program is no big deal, right? If you have thousand lines of program, you have thousand punch cards. Okay? Now thousand punch card will be a stack of something like a feet. Okay? So this is typically how a punch card looked. Okay? I still have some old punch cards lying with me uh, for historical reasons. And just take thousand of them. So each punch card will have just one statement and you have thousand stacks with you. And then you pass it on to an operator and go away. This operator at some point of time will put it in card reader. So there are hundreds of thousands of cards which are submitted every day. This operator puts it and then suppose we had this kind of situation that you made a mistake while typing a punch card. Okay? You had no way of correcting it. Okay? Now if you come back next day and you find that only error in your program was because certain blanks were not in certain right places, okay? the whole day is wasted. So you replace that punch card, come again. So whatever errors programmers would have made while typing punch cards, compiler was trying to take care of them. Okay? I mean today it's not required. Okay? But for historical reasons, when it persists, because this language had, you still have some old code, and it persists. Okay? So really what happened here was that people were just punching their programs on this card, and this card was then put on a card. Okay? And you wanted to make sure that whatever errors you had during punching, those are not really the errors which delay your execution, and therefore <coughs> all such errors you will try to catch in the phase of compilation, and we just ignore that, because we did not have screen editors at that point of time. Okay. And that was an important use of punch cards. Anyone knows history of, of these punch cards? What is the name of this card? Anyone knows what is this card called? Who designed it? Why, why it was designed? It was designed before computers. It was designed sometime in 1880. For? Swing machines. Swing machines had cards, but not these kind of cards. They had goals. So swing machines had design cards, yeah, but not these kind of cards. I'm talking about this specific card. So this was designed by a statistician called Hollerith in 1880. And he had a machine called tabulator. And the first major use of this tabulator machine and this punch card was done was during the US census data in 1880. Yeah. And uh, really what happened was that if you have this punch card with certain holes, you put it in certain scanner and some there will be some connections which will be made so some needles will go and where they can penetrate in the holes there the connection will be made and some certain computations will happen. Okay? So for the first time tabulation of all the census data was done and later on this company okay, which was uh, making these tabulators then after several mergers it actually emerged into IBM. Okay? So that was perhaps the beginning of IBM in some small way. Okay. So let's move on, okay? And let's talk about different kind of problems, okay? So one problem we are saying is all this blank, okay? Now what about this? Is this a valid statement in a program? If it's a keyword in my programming language. Is this a valid statement in my program? Yeah. Well, I mean, answer is, if you say no, that's not the correct answer. You immediately have to ask the question, is keyword a reserved word in my language? Because if keyword is not a reserved word, then there's nothing wrong with this. And there are languages like PL1, which say keyword is not reserved. And if they are not reserved, I can write statement like this, which is a valid statement. Okay. And what is the statement? It says, if then, then, then is assigned else, else, else is assigned then. Now, it is for compiler to figure out which is a keyword, which is a Boolean operator, we can identify. Okay? So here it says, if that is true, then that is assigned else, else, else is assigned that. Okay? Interesting, right? Okay? So answer is, when I say that whether this is valid or not, answer is not no, but answer is, is if a reserved keyword in my language or not. Okay? And if it is, then you know it is not valid, but if it is not, okay, then I can write any kind of expression. So you have to be aware of this. Okay? Uh, here is another one. If if then then is assigned then plus one. Okay? 
right? So this is also valid. Okay. Declarations. Okay. There is. Oh, uh, we are running short of time, so I think we will have to close here and then we will move on. I think the next class is waiting outside. So tomorrow we will start our discussion on this one. And those of you who wish, you can keep these cards as souvenirs. Okay. I have some.